This week on the Computer Chronicles, part two of our coverage of the European Technology Roundtable and Exhibition in Rome. We'll explain the telecom meltdown and why you still can't get low-cost broadband connections to the Internet. We'll look at the battle over digital rights management as Hollywood and the Internet face off over digital distribution. We'll show you one solution to bridging the digital divide, an ambitious project to ring the Earth with a broadband satellite network. And we'll tell you why experts are looking to Asia, and China in particular, as the key to future economic growth at home. Part two of our coverage of the ETRA conference coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you by the Oracle Small Business Suite, one completely integrated application that helps make it easier to run your business, including accounting, sales and service, your web presence, and more. Additional funding is provided by PC to PC, the online migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one. Hi, and welcome to this special edition of the Computer Chronicles, part two of our coverage of the ETRA conference here in Rome. This is the Roman Forum behind me, once the bustling center of a very powerful Roman Empire. Now, of course, it is just ruins, the remnants of a fallen empire. In some ways, this is a metaphor for today's high-tech industry, once thought to be invincible, but now very much worried about its future. The dot-com crash was just one part of the economic jolt that hit the technology industry during the past year. The other part was the so-called telecom meltdown. Billions of dollars were lost in what turned out to be a failed attempt to quickly roll out new wireless and broadband services as telecom infrastructure companies and rich content providers struggle to understand this new market. The revenue per, su per subscriber has probably not lived up to expectations, in part because the service didn't deserve it. The service was kind of a lousy service, not a lot of value-added services, no compelling applications. I've always thought it was a little archaic that the web, which was touted as this great new revolution, was all the printed word for the most part. We're now getting to music, we're now getting to video. I think the big obstacle to broadband is price. People may pay willing to pay 10 bucks more for broadband, but do they want to pay 39.95 or 49.95 for it? At least now when the when the value add isn't there, when there aren't just these great applications that you can use, people are not willing to pay that much more. Most like many technology problems, there is a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. No broadband service until we have broadband content. And no broadband content until we have broadband pipes. Giving us a chance to have more data per, per minute and more images and more videos, etc. Making the information technology much more sophisticated, much more interesting, much more compelling for the users. This has not happened. And until this happens, it will slow down the internet revolution. The great thing about the internet is that it needs, it has a lot of potential, a lot of content, and you want to be able to put all that content in the pipeline. If the pipeline is not wide enough, there is no content. Everybody's overestimated, you know, the ability of the, of the telcos to, to build that stuff out. It turned out to be very expensive at a time when the companies didn't have money to spend. I think Eric Benamou today talked about building fiber optic and then wireless for the last mile. That seems to me to be probably the way it's going to be, the least expensive way to do it and the fastest way to do it. But that still is several years out. So all the, you know, the momentum that was supposed to happen because of the broadband build out is still going to be stalled. Part of the problem is that the telecom industry got caught up in the dot com mania. They thought it would be easy to build and sell fiber optic connections to businesses and consumers hungry for fast internet access. But it didn't turn out that way. Not all of this can be explained by the general downturn. I think initially there were much more significant growth pains than we expected. The logistical issues associated with uh, the delivery of broadband was vastly underestimated. The number of truck rolls required to install broadband uh, made the whole business uh, very difficult from a financial returns perspective. Ironically, the biggest driver of broadband growth was Napster, 
which was essentially shut down by the federal courts and the music industry. But it turns out the, the, the distribution, dissemination of uh, audio content like Napster did was extremely popular and accounted for a growing percentage of broadband traffic. And, and all of the broadband carriers which I have spoken to have confirmed that as Napster basically was, was hit by, <coughs> by, by these judgments, there was a drop in broadband traffic. So we, we could clearly see that, uh, that rich content, whether it's audio or, or, or video, accounts for uh, a good bit of the, the benefits associated with broadband. So the broadband problem gets even more complicated, since its growth depends not only on broadband content, but on content owners agreeing to new rules of distribution. Hollywood is in a trap that, and, and the record, I include the record companies in this, they have a distribution model that uh, is on some fundamental basis uh, unsustainable. Well, Hollywood's still very hostile. You know, they don't, you know, the paramounts of the world still aren't willing to hold the meetings, uh, uh, you know, because of digital rights management issues. And of course, why shouldn't they be? You know, they, they, they think they own the content. Artists think they own the content. The companies think they own the content. The distributors want a piece of the content. Until we saw, until somebody solves the digital rights management issue. And now some of the, some of the solutions out there are, are fascinating. You know, there was one guy I met uh, uh, from Romania who's one of the DVD pioneers who's looking to embed uh, uh, DRM, digital rights management technology, into routers, into Cisco routers, and, and then get it accepted by Hollywood. So there are a lot of possible solutions out there. 3Com's Eric Benamou right. says it's reasonable for content owners to resist broadband distribution example, until um, the rights questions can be resolved. If you're going to deliver rich quality content, DVD quality content, to people's homes or, or community schools or, or even wow. remote far-flung business offices, <coughs> you have to have a way to protect this digital content. And this is a case where another part of the industry needs to get fixed as well in order for this to happen. Uh, today it's just all too easy to, to, to pirate content and to make as many copies as you want in a fraction of a second. But some think the Hollywood crowd is asking for more than is reasonable. What they want to do now is basically capture control over all distribution of media. And it's so clear that the way media will be distributed is through networks. And basically, these guys want to tell us how it will be done. And uh, they not only want to own the copyrights, they want to own the distribution methods. That would be fairly unprecedented if they, get, if they get away with that. It is a complicated issue to find the right balance between so-called fair use of things like movies and music and outright piracy. If you enable people to, make, to technically make copies in their homes completely unrestricted, you do have some serious risk that this content will be devalued. Um, so uh, there are notions of like fair use that need to be re-examined. What, what is fair for me to use? Can I make a copy of uh, this, this song or this movie to play in, to play in my, on my VCR upstairs or downstairs? Can I give it to a friend? If, I, if I'm a schoolmaster in the school, can I make a few copies for my students? Um, uh, there are things like this that need to be examined. But the, the fact is today there's insufficient content protection. The digital rights management question is so complicated because it involves whether we retain uh, basic fair, right, uh, fair use rights, which I think is essential, and at the same time find a way to reward people for being creative. While the problem here is a legal one, it's driven by technology, the ability of a PC connected to the internet to be a powerful distribution network. The PC architecture of today makes it possible for me, if I, if I receive a, a movie, to make as many copies as I want. That's because the, even if the movie was encrypted, if I decrypt it and I get a clear copy on, on my PC, then I can make as many copies as I want. So if you manage to tie together the process of decrypting and rendering, rendering the contents, you make this a single, undivisible, undivisible operation, then, then you have 
technology which, is a, which, which has good enforcement capabilities. But if you separate the two, then at some point, the content exists in the clear, free, free to be copied in your machine. And the PC architecture enables you to do that. It was not conceived to, to pay attention to this. You would think these copyright issues would have been settled a long time ago when the home VCR became commonplace. But the efficiency of the digital world makes the old analog rules irrelevant. While you couldn't make a copy on your VCR, uh, it does take you a fair amount of time to do that. And your VCR, most VCRs today are not connected to the internet. So even if you made a, a few copies, you could not necessarily send them, uh, send them by, by the hundreds or the thousands uh, to a long distribution list for free. With no resolution in sight for digital rights management, many of the entrepreneurs here, who usually don't want government to have a role in the development of new technologies, were saying that maybe the feds have to play a bigger role in facilitating a broadband infrastructure. We Americans tend to have a great aversion to government intervention, but uh, what has happened, for example, with DSL suggests that there's a role for government where many of the DSL providers said that basically the local phone companies just blocked and, and prevented them from really selling the service as fast as they could have. So I think there's a, we've gone through this pendulum swing of total free market, and my, my guess is you're going to see some more regulation when the government feels that regulation will improve opportunity. I think there is a great point of debate, much as Silicon Valley maybe would not like to hear it, about what part government has to play in funding and proliferating um, the expense, the, the huge capital expense it takes to put out good infrastructure. So like the highways, like the telephone network to begin with, is there some balance when you take in social factors of where the government ha as a whole has to come up with a, a, a public policy initiative in order to get broadband out there? In fact, Eric yeah, Benamy wants to see something like President Kennedy's challenge in the 1960s to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Let us, by the end of the decade, ensure that 100 million U.S. households have access to 100 megabits per second service. Uh, if we think in those terms, then we have to think way beyond the current difficulties associated with DSL or, or cable. 100 megabits per second is a different technology. It's two orders of magnitude faster than current technology. I think it's a, actually a national security issue that we put broadband to every home and business in America when you think about the, uh, the, the fundamental higher safety in, in decentralization. I think people, I think we have to do this. And I think that it's, a, it's not something we should leave to the telephone company. While most of the industry leaders here agree that the government needs to play a role, they want it to be a limited one. There's a need for leadership. There's a need for making this national priority. There's a need to rethink some of our policies, which clearly are not working. But <coughs> I certainly wouldn't go as far as, uh, as adopting some models which perhaps have worked well in, in Korea or, or in France. Uh, it would certainly be a big mistake for the government to start picking winners and losers in a fast-moving field. Uh, certainly, if the government were to say, we shall deliver DSL uh, to so many households, it would be a mistake. So is there a killer app out there that will drive broadband? Ironically, one theory is that the current fear of terrorism may provide the answer. Desktop to desktop video conferencing. You know, we've been promised video phones since 1964. I think they're going to happen in the next five years. And they're going to happen because we have broadband and we've got personal computers with little cameras. And the new environment that we live in is going to make travel riskier and more expensive. Finally, what about DSL and cable modems? Don't we already have broadband? Eric Benamou says no. We should not think about DSL and cable as an endpoint. It's just a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone. It's an intermediate technology. It is fast enough to make a difference, but we can do far, far better and create a much more fundamental transformation. The rollout of broadband was just one part of the problem that faced telecom industry executives over the past year. There were also high-priced license fees for wireless spectrum and a failure to successfully solve the problem of the last mile. In the United States, there were also the unexpected consequences of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. 
the Act of 96, which caused all of these new um, telecom service providers to be created, I mean, obviously that's been a complete failure. Many hundreds of millions of dollars, if not a couple of billions of dollars, have been lost on that, and yet we have no broadband services for, for the masses. So, so clearly the, ca the private capital markets were unable and have lost their appetite to fund this big infrastructure rollout. The telco meltdown has happened because the Deregulation Act of 1996 has not panned out the way we anticipated. We anticipated that the local telcos would give access to the long distance companies. And this has not happened because the local companies, the local telco, have not respected the law. They have tried to trick everybody around. And as a definition, the deregulation which should have happened and the interpenetration between the local and the long distance network have not occurred. While everyone here was talking about the dot-com crash and the telecom meltdown in the same breath, there were significant differences between the two. With the telecoms, we're talking about debt, you know, something like uh, 30 or 40 billion dollars of debt that the world's telecom carriers have accumulated just over a two-year period because of third generation and other uh, licenses that may mean nothing. And as we've seen, we've seen Bluetooth uh, almost disappear and other Wi-Fi standards come in. The other big difference between the dot-com collapse and the telecom mess is that most of the dot-coms are gone. The, the telecoms, I think, will survive. Every single one of these, whether it's France Telecom, British Telecom, AT&T, they're going to be around for the long haul. Uh, they have the staying power. But the dot-coms never had the staying power. And I, and I think history will prove that 95% of these companies that made it to the public markets will disappear. What the two meltdowns do have in common is that they left a wake as their failures trickle down to their suppliers. All this created the, the absolute bankruptcy of a number of firms, including North Point, uh, and the losses, uh, huge losses of money of uh, COVAD and the other firms. And immediately after, we, can, we have seen that uh, it has an impact on the equipment companies, the, equi the company which were e put giving equipment to those companies. And we have seen Nortel, Lucent, to have to pare down. We have a trickling effect, a negative domino theory. One possible solution to the telecom problem is a long odds bet by two of the richest men in the world, Bill Gates, and Craig McCaw, who think that satellites will provide the ultimate broadband infrastructure. They've created a company called Ico Teledesic, whose goal is to connect the entire world with low-cost, satellite-based broadband. Bill Owens is the former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the former commander of the 6th Fleet. He's faced many complex challenges, but none as daunting companies. as putting up a global satellite network. It's a marketplace that no one has ever uh, made an experience uh, in making a business in. Here is a business that requires several billion dollars to start the business before you make the first dollar. And during that time, the nature of orbiting satellites is that you have to build a global business so you have to have a business in India and in China and in these states and Japan and in Chad and in Israel, etc. You must, in fact, build a global business. DSL, cable modems, even fiber optics are less expensive than a satellite network. But only a satellite system can cover the entire world. There are many, many places, far more than 50% of the developed countries, let alone the non-developed countries, can get those kinds of services. So there will be a dramatic need for this kind of capability. And if you can deliver it economically, if you can deliver it quickly, I want it tomorrow morning, put the dish on your roof tomorrow morning and have the service. Uh, and if, in fact, uh, this can be made in a cost structure that makes for a good business, we think that this is a very viable uh, business model. But many analysts and investors here think building a satellite infrastructure is way too expensive, and they say Teledesic will never work. Well, Teledesic, I think, is pie in the sky. <laughs> I th I've not seen, you know, for all of these global, whether they're data services or whether they're voice-based services, um, I've not seen the business, the economics that justify it. 
there are there are, are huge issues I think with consumer price points versus their cost infrastructure that have yet to convince me about the fact that it can be viable. But Bill Owens doesn't buy that, citing the success of the DirecTV satellite business. There was a, a myth in the, in the TV business uh, 10 years ago that cable was going to take over everything, that we would have cable TV everywhere, that we'd all have our coax cable to our homes, that of course you wouldn't need anything else. And then came the idea that, well, maybe for a couple hundred dollars you could put a dish on your roof and you'd get 100 channels or 500 channels of TV direct to your home. And uh, people started to see that, oh my goodness, this is going to be price competitive. And when they came to realize that that was the case, uh, the direct TV marketplace took off. We think that the same thing will happen in this world of two-way high bandwidth communications. Finally, given the digital divide problems, which seem to be splitting the entire world into technology haves and have-nots, Bill Owens thinks something like Teledesic can have social and political consequences far beyond mere technology. The greatest thing that we can do for the non-developed countries to give them an ability to have inexpensive bandwidth. It's more important, I think, than vaccinations. It's more important, I think, than disease control. If we can share knowledge with the three billion people in the world who have never made a phone call, their lives are inevitably going to get better from the standpoint of health care, education, and business, and we will do a lot to bring them into a civilized world, a world where their, their whole lifestyles can be elevated from what they are today. This conference was held against the gloomy background of a weak stock market and a war against terrorism. But if there was one really bright spot here at ETRA, it had nothing to do with the U.S. or the U.S. economy. It was the Asian market and China in particular, where the annual growth rate this year is expected to be 10 percent and where they are increasingly becoming part of the global Internet community. What it used to be is that, that most of the capitalistic uh, world was uh, made up of about 500 million people. You know, roughly the U.S., part of Europe, Japan, um, that kind of made up the industrialized world. Now, with the advent of the Internet, uh, all six billion of us can participate in this world economy, and we could see growth. Uh, that fuels us for many, many years just on taking what we have existent and moving it out to the rest of the world. Uh, that doesn't even incorporate the fact that there will be some great entrepreneurs in China and India and Pakistan. Surprisingly, one of the hot technology areas in China and throughout Asia is speech recognition. The kind of improvements we've made over the last couple of years now have us shipping these products in an integrated way in Japan and China. And those are two countries where, of course, the keyboard is a tougher problem and speech recognition is slightly easier than most other languages. And so we think if we can get broad horizontal usage there, that's the first leading indicator that it should be the, uh, one of the mainstream ways of interacting with the PC in the world at large. Another reason the industry leaders here were looking to Asia was to see if there was something to be learned about government's role there in building up the telecommunications infrastructure. I think the one thing that we may be seeing from Asia is a little more um, uh, indication that some government intervention and some government support actually really does help. The United States has always come from a very laissez-faire, all we want from the government is to keep their hands off us. Uh, I think maybe we're starting to learn from the examples of Europe and Asia that there are times when a little more government intervention and regulation is useful. But there were doubters here at ETRA about the importance of Asia and China in particular. I do believe that uh, today and for the years to come, China will be a blip and we will really remain a blip in the technology industry. China. Uh, have two or three factors which don't allow a, a huge contribution to the technology industry. One, it doesn't have 
an open internet space. That is a very important. And so it will be very important inside the country. And uh, there are 360 million television set, but they all provide the same content, which is all organized by the state. You need an age of democracy and openness to create a huge market. That's it for part two of our coverage of the ETRA conference in Rome. In the coming weeks, we'll have more, including predictions on the HP Compact merger, the controversy over Microsoft's passport application, latest on PDAs and mobile computing, an update on the B2B business, and a look at the future of the Internet. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffe. Computer Chronicles is brought to you by the Oracle Small Business Suite, one completely integrated application that helps make it easier to run your business, including accounting, sales and service, your web presence, and more. Additional funding is provided by pc to pc the online migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one.